Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana Voice for Peace, Justice, Human Rights, and Intercultural Encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ. We're really delighted today. Uh, this has been a long time coming and uh, the, the guy had to write a book for us to invite him. Uh, we're delighted today to speak with our friend, Jonathan Katab, co-founder of, among others, al Haq, uh, the Mandela Institute for Political Prisoners and Nonviolence International. Jonathan is also on the board of the Bethlehem Bible College and is president of the board of Holy Land Trust. Jonathan, uh, welcome, it's good to see you. Thank you, it's good to be here and I can recognize many good friends uh, whose pictures appear here and there. Uh, hello to all of you and I'm, I'm glad for this opportunity. I knew that you would have many, many of your friends on, uh, on uh, the call today. And so I, I know that they will wanna know how you and your wife are and your family are faring during this time of the pandemic. You're, you're, you're calling in from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, I understand. Correct. As we say, alhamdulillah, we are uh, surviving. These are very difficult times uh, where we can't meet with our friends and our family and loved ones, except maybe on Zoom. Uh, we're trying to be very uh, responsible and careful. Uh, we wear our masks, we uh, minimize our contact with others as much as possible. Uh, this is the way it is. Jonathan didn't have enough work to do in Palestine, so he's in Pennsylvania now uh, holding fast uh, uh, for the uh, anti-Trump forces there in Pennsylvania. So you're taking on the American resistance as well as the Pal Palestinian resistance. Is that right, Jonathan? I, I think those of us who have the ability uh, to, uh, to uh, influence in any way events in the United States, I think have an obligation for the whole world <laughs> because the United States is, in fact, uh, part of the rest of the world and not always the good part <laughs> in terms of impacting it. Jonathan, you're, uh, you have this new book, Beyond the Two-State uh, uh, two Solution. Uh, it was published by Nonviolence International, a 501c3 that you and Mubarak Awad founded in 1989. Tell us about Nonviolence International and tell us how your book came about? Well, Nonviolence International is, 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 is this uh, really uh, small but tremendously effective uh, organization that does nonviolence work throughout the world, not just on the issue of Palestine. Uh, we have, uh, I don't want to call it branches or affiliates, but we have contacts throughout the world and we are totally committed to the issue of nonviolence. We have uh, inherited basically uh, Gene Sharp's uh, works, and oh, wow. uh, we're soon going to be coming out with a uh, very comprehensive book by Michael Beer, uh, listing and expanding the techniques and tactics that can be used in nonviolence. Yeah, so I'm very proud to be associated with uh, Nonviolence International. And uh, your book, tell us how it came about. The book, uh, booklet, I don't know. It, it, it started actually uh, as uh, struggling with the whole issue of the two states. How come everybody thinks that two states have collapsed? The idea of a Palestinian state is not about to happen. Uh, and yet nobody is willing to abandon the paradigm, the language, uh, the framework of a two-state solution when you already have about 700,000 uh, uh, Jewish settlers living in the small, tiny 22% of Palestine that was slated to be a Palestinian state. Uh, so, so we had to struggle with that issue. How do we deal with it? Uh, and then uh, there was uh, a friend of mine, uh, 
uh, Robert Pavs to uh, Herbs, who uh, is a, a lawyer and a human rights lawyer. Uh, and and, and we, we, we sat together and said, if we accept that the two-state solution has collapsed, what do we have instead? And is it possible to come up with a new paradigm, a new way of looking at it? Can we ask Palestinians, what is it that you really, really want? And can we ask even Zionist Jews, what is it that you really, really want? Uh, once you realize that you can't have this land exclusively to yourself, how can you share it? Is it possible that you can get what you want without necessarily denying, demonizing, delegitimizing, or physically obliterating the other side? And maybe it is possible. Maybe we can put together uh, a vision uh, for it. So that's how the, 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 the idea started. It, it was more of, a, of an intellectual exercise. You know, apart from whether we can accomplish it or, or how do we get there, is it possible? Can we even theoretically consider a Palestinian nationalism that also accepts and embraces the fact that there's about six or seven million non-Arabs who are living in Palestine? and who are going nowhere. And is it possible to have a Zionism which also recognizes that there's another people who are living in the land and who are equally part of it and who are going nowhere? In a way, it's, it's, it's an admission that both of these two movements have failed in their basic premise, at least to the extent that they try to be exclusive they have failed to eliminate the other side. Can they live together? Is it possible? Is it conceivable? Well, uh, I want to get to your book. Uh, I have a couple of questions beforehand, but before I even get to them, I want to point out that what Jonathan has done is he's typed into the chat room uh, the website of Nonviolence International. If you'd like to cut and paste if you'd like to cut and paste that link where you can download a PDF copy of the book for free. So uh, uh, anyway, that, that's in the chat room. If you want to go there and then um, cut and paste, it's up at the very uh, uh, top. Oh, there it is. Terry has, uh, has uh, uh, posted it there in the chat room as well. Thanks, Terry. So Jonathan, um, uh, I want to get to the book, but there's been a lot happening with regard to the Middle East just recently. Um, the U.S. absolutist support for Israel has been bipartisan, as you know, uh, over many uh, administrations and in Congress. But the Trump administration has been particularly egregious in implementing pro-Israel policies. Uh, say a word uh, about this, Jonathan, about what's happened just in the last three and a half years that's made your proposal even more difficult and about Secretary of State Pompeo's recent visit to Israel, uh, uh, which really uh, um, uh, was a slap in the face to Palis the Palestinian struggle for justice. Well, I, I think what, what has happened under this administration and particularly with uh, Pompeo uh, is, is that the, the right wing in Israel, the most extreme right wing, even by Israeli standards, have sort of uh, taken over or given, been given permission to run US policy towards Israel-Palestine. I mean, they've always been influential and, and uh, every administration in the US has been very clearly uh, pro-Israeli. But, but now the right wing have an end. They have the ambassador, they have the secretary of state, they have the chief negotiator, uh, they have all those who are in charge of U.S. foreign policy towards Israel and Palestine uh, right now in the pocket of the most extreme right wing settlers. Uh, and, and, and what really brought this about has also been the influence of 
uh, Christian Zionists who are uh, involved in this process. And sometimes they bring up things that the Israeli government isn't that particularly interested in, or at least it's not very high on their priority. I say, here, take this. Uh, why, why don't you just annex everything? Uh, well, why don't you just uh, move the embassy? Moving the embassy was done to please the white evangelical Christian Zionists more than to please Netanyahu. That wasn't on his list. He was more interested in Iran at the time. He said, okay, we're going to move the embassy. We couldn't say no, by all means. And then they say, we want to recognize the Golan Heights. That wasn't on anybody's radar. That was just a giveaway. And, and if you read the Trump plan, uh, I mean, most Israelis look at it and shake their heads and say, what, what is this nonsense? This isn't real. I mean, Oslo Agreement, for all its egregious uh, problems, uh, was, was at least an attempt to deal with Palestinians and Israelis in, in a very uneven way, of course. Uh, but, but the Trump plan is, is like something that's out of the fantasies of the extreme right wing. Uh, why don't we get them not only to recognize us as a Jewish state, why don't we talk about the rights of Jewish refugees in Arab countries and say that any money that should come to refugees probably should go to them. <laughs> uh, stuff that is really... Uh, not on anybody's uh, realistic list, is now being made part of the Trump uh, plan. So th th this is what's new, uh, I think, with the Trump administration, uh, is that evangelical Christian Zionists sort of took over uh, U.S. policy in this area. Let's let's get into your book and 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 uh, uh, talk specifics. You re, you alluded to this just a couple of answers ago when you said we need to ask Zionists what is it that you really want, your rock bottom needs, and can these needs be accommodated in Palestine Israel without thoroughly negating the interests and reality of Palestinians? And we also need to ask Palestinians what is it that you really want, your rock bottom needs. Can these be accomplished in a state where you're not dominant and where Israeli Jews are roughly equal in number to Palestinian Arabs? You want to you wanna name a couple of the non-negotiables, these requirements, as you call them, for each side? Okay. Uh, b b before I do that, I, I, I actually went through this exercise with, with, with some uh, of, my, of my Zionist Jewish friends. And I'm not talking about leftist, uh, progressive Zionists. I'm talking about, you know, mainline uh, people. I say, what is it that you want? I, I met this rabbi. I say, you say you want a Jewish state. Well, you know, how can a state be Jewish? You're not going to circumcise the state. What is a Jewish state to you? And he said, well, he thought about it. And he says, I want a state where any Jew anytime, for any reason, no questions asked, can go and live and be able to defend himself. I said, maybe I can give you something better. How about a state where any Jew, anytime, anywhere, no questions asked, can go and live where he doesn't need to defend himself because nobody's out to get him. <laughs> And he thought about that. He says, yeah, you know, what is it that you really, really want? We are told that a nation state is the way to get it. And I say, maybe you can get it without, or maybe with a nation state that's not exclusive to you, that accepts you and, and recognizes you and accommodates you and gives you rights, but also gives other people. The local people. And, and, and with Palestinians, the question is also the same, because for many times we were told uh, Palestinians want a Palestinian state. Why do we want a Palestinian state? Well, we want a Palestinian state where we can be proud Palestinian Arabs and we can live wherever we want to, as we want to. We want a passport so that we can travel. 
We want an airport so that we can fly out of that airport. We want a uh, parliament that can pass laws that, 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 that serve us, that help us. Uh, so if we can, if you give us something, you call it a state, but that doesn't give us those things, what do we need it for? If, if we get a, an airport as we had for a while, there was an airport in Gaza at the beginning of the Oslo process. But to fly out to that airport, you had to take a bus to the Gaza checkpoint to be searched. And then you take him back and then you fly out. So it takes you five hours instead of flying out of Tel Aviv where it takes you three hours. So I have, I have a, a, an airport, but it means nothing because I can't fly in and out. I have a document that's called a passport, but I can't issue passports to my Palestinian cousin who's living in Jordan or in Lebanon. And I can't even use my own passport without permission from the Israelis. So uh, to have a passport, to have a, a, a flag, to have something that you call a state, but which doesn't address my needs is it, not, not helpful. What, what you list a number of objections and challenges uh, from each side. You want to you want to talk about a couple of the most prominent ones? Okay, I think basic to all of them is the idea of exclusivity. If I think Israel is a Jewish state of the Jews for the Jews by the Jews and I want to exclude non-Jews or discriminate against non-Jews, uh, then, then obviously I have a problem. By the same token, if I say Palestine Arabi, Palestine is Arab. And I don't deal with the fact that there's six or seven million non-Arabs. <laughs> well, some of them are Arabs, uh, Oriental Jews, but, but at least five million who do not address themselves and who do not identify themselves as Arab, but for whom this is home. This has become home, right or wrong. This is where they live. They have historic, religious, and other economic and other roots in this land, and they're going nowhere. Can I live with them? Can they live with me? Can we live together? Can we both call this home, call this our country? Once we abandon the idea of exclusivity and are open to the other, then all sorts of ideas come up. And we can come up with some very creative ways to address our needs. For, for Palestinians, I would say the number one need is equality. We want equality. Whether we're talking about in the Galilee or in Gaza or in the West Bank or in Jerusalem, we want equality. We want nothing that the Jews don't want for themselves. If they will give us equality, then we can accommodate a lot. What do Israelis want? What do Israeli Jews want? What do Israeli Zionists want? Well, they want a Jewish state. Well, what does that mean? You, you want to uh, celebrate the Jewish holidays? You want the Sabbath to be more or less respected? We can do that. They have no problem. You want the right of return after 2,000 years? So do we. We want the right of return. We are, we are Palestinians who actually remember within living memory, who still hold the keys to their houses and the deeds to their land. Uh, so, okay, if you want to have your right of return and we have our right of return, then, then maybe we can, we can live with that. We can live with that. Uh, this, is, this is the approach that I am bringing. And, and, and I want to say that uh, right now, we are in a situation of paralysis. We yeah. are in a situation where both parties are at an impasse. I mean, the Israelis, of course, are the, the, the stronger party. The Zionist movement thinks it has everything. Why should it make any accommodation? They have all the land under their control. 
they run the whole show. But how long can they do that? How long can they do that? And, and can they live or do they want to live in a situation where it's effective de jure as well as de facto apartheid, where Jews have rights, whether it's in the Galilee or in the West Bank, but Arabs don't have the same rights, again, whether it's in the Galilee or in the West Bank. So, so we need to, to, to move beyond the impasse that we are living in now. Let's get to that. Uh, uh, one of the parts of the book I found very interesting was your discussion of what you call the unique features of uh, this conflict. And, and you listed a, a, a few. The role of Palestine in the hearts and minds of the Arab world, the relationship between Jewish Israelis and the Jewish diaspora, and a, as well as Israel-Palestine as the cradle of three monotheistic religions. And the part of your analysis that I found hopeful was that you say that, quote, these three elements, rather than being obstacles, can empower a just solution. How can those three elements, you know, the relationship between Palestinians, you know, and uh, the Arab world, Jewish Israelis and Jewish diaspora, and the three monotheistic religions having come from Israel-Palestine, how can those three empower a just solution in your view? Well, uh, we can take them one at a time. Uh, the first is the Arab uh, one. Uh, despite the spate of normalizations that have been uh, promoted recently by Netanyahu and Pompeo, uh, a recent study was done by the Arab uh, Center of Washington, you know, which, which shows clearly that the overwhelming views of the Arab populations, including in the Gulf countries, including in Jordan, in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia and the others, are, are totally opposed to any kind of normalization with Israel until the Palestinian question is addressed. Palestine is at the heart of the Arab world, not only geographically, but also uh, psychologically. It represents uh, the, the place where the West has crushed and oppressed the Arab world. It represents the hope for the future, as well as the way to deal with the Western world and with the foreigners and with the others who have uh, ruled, colonized, uh, and, 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 and basically crushed the Arab world. So Palestine will always be important for the Arab world. When, when the Palestinian uh, singer uh, won the Arab idol, mm -hmm. uh, I, I happened to be in uh, Morocco at that time. And it's amazing how people felt about it. Ordinary people in the street, they wanted him to win. Uh, and because they felt this is us, this is the ordinary people. Uh, this is what brings the Arab world together. So for the Arabs, Palestine is right at the center, even though the Arab rulers may feel otherwise and the Arab governments may feel otherwise. Uh, and, and, and for Jews in Israel also, there is no question that there is some kind of relationship. And I will not uh, buy the Zionist claim that, that Israel is the be all and end all of, 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 of Jews and Judaism, but it means something. It is an important place, just like it is the center of the three monotheistic religions. Uh, for Christians, it means something. For Muslims, it means something. For Jews, it means something. And this can be a positive thing. It doesn't have to be a negative thing. It doesn't have to mean exclusivity. It doesn't have to mean that you destroy everybody else's sanctuaries and rights and uh, important things. No, they become part of what brings us together and what makes it important for us. You know, I, I spoke at a... Uh, at, at, at the synagogue, uh, the 100th anniversary of the Belfort Declaration, I said, okay, you say 
it's important for us every year we say next year in Jerusalem. That's true. It's important. Do you know that Muslims, not once a year, five times every single day, turn towards Mecca and pray? But that doesn't give the Muslims any rights over Saudi Arabia's oil riches <laughs> to go there and say, this is mine. This is my oil. No. Mecca is important. It's a site of pilgrimage. It's an important connection for you as uh, religiously, but it doesn't give you uh, physical, political rights in Saudi Arabia. So yes, Jerusalem is important to Jews. It's also important to Muslims. It's also important to Christians. But that doesn't allow you to lay exclusive claims to that land in the name of God and religion. I have a question here from the chat room. Uh, how do you think Palestinians get included in the conversation uh, and, and get to participate in the actual negotiations as equals and not be forced or ignored in the, uh, in the negotiations? Well, so far, we have been told that negotiations should be conducted on the basis of reality. You have to be realistic. And, and, and reality is that Palestinians have very little power and the Israelis have all the power. So Palestinians said, no, 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 no. It should be based on international law. It should be based on justice, on morality, on equality. So we're always bringing in all these other elements to sort of even up the battlefield. Uh, Trump uh, and, and the Trump administration, Pompeo is very strong on this. Forget about international law. Deal with the reality. Be realistic. I say, you know, realistically, you know, we have no power. Just like telling the slaves, be realistic. Telling the blacks in South Africa, be realistic. Telling all the occupied people, be realistic. We have power, we have technology, we have wealth, we have the law on our side, we, we are it. Be realistic and accept the fact that you are nothing, that you are nobodies. And I'm saying, no, that's, that's not helpful. That's not helpful at all. Palestinians are part of the heart of the problems and have to be addressed as such for, 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 for peace to come about. Now, if you say, if your definition of peace is just for the slave to accept their slave, slavery, uh, then uh, that, that, that's something totally different. Here's another question from our mutual friend, Philip Farah. Uh, uh, why opt for a confessional ethic allocation of government function? This was disastrous in Lebanon. Jews control defense and Palestinians control police. What do you think about that yes. uh, arrangement? Yes, yes, yes. I, 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 uh, this is a uh, maybe a controversial part of my attempts to deal with the reality of how people feel and where people are at and whether we can address their fears and their uh, concerns. Uh, and, and, and I know it's controversial because basically I'm, I'm saying that the, after the Holocaust, after the, I think the lies that have been told to the Jews that you can't depend on anybody but yourself, that you really need to be in control. And I'm saying, okay, maybe I can give you some control, uh, but with some restrictions. So I came up with this idea, people may like it, people may not. And I said, you can have as a matter of constitutional law, the top five positions in the army, the head of the Air Force, Navy, Nuclear Commission, uh, be Jewish by constitutional law. But every other position in the army will be on the basis of merit. And the head of the police will always be Arab. 
because we we Palestinians have suffered a lot. Also, we have our our traumas in our history. So at least that the head of the police, and that includes the border patrol, will always be Arab. But the principle is primarily a principle of equality. We'll make some concession to to your exaggerated uh, security fears, but it doesn't give you the authority to do what you want. It's within the law. And it will allow you a measure of psychological, uh, shall I say, comfort uh, that, that, that ultimately the head of the army is going to be Jewish. So he's not going to be going around massacring Jews. You, uh, One of the things that I appreciated in your book is that it's more of a framework. Uh, you, you, you paint a picture of, of trying to assuage the comfort level of both sides psychologically. And you try to build then a, a, a military slash security framework along with a political legal framework. So you, you constantly have these three, I'm not ignoring the theological or religious part of it, but you, you constantly have these three in conversation, the psychological, emotional, you know, understandings that people bring to this in terms of security, but political, legal, as well as military security. Was that a conscious decision you made as you were writing the book? Well, I was trying very hard to listen and to understand and to address how people felt as well as the reality on the ground. Uh, more important than the than the, than the defense and security. I also talk about what I call the demographic demon and, and, yeah. and the fallacy of the 51%. Many people, when they talk about the one state solution, they're worried about the numbers because they think whoever has 51% will control, oppress, and repress uh, the minorities. And I'm saying that that's not necessarily true. We can create a situation where everybody can participate in the system and where 51% or even 60% or even 70% do not have the right to discriminate against the minority or to ignore them uh, or to suppress them. Uh, so democracy doesn't, yes, it means majority rule, but it doesn't mean that 51% of the electorate can oppress everybody else. That is not allowed. So I go into uh, some explanation of why 51% uh, is not the be all and end all of a democracy. It is important to have a multi uh, ethnic, multi uh, cultural society that recognizes and accepts and allows the stakeholders even if they are not the majority, that allows them to feel that this is my country as well, that, that I live in here. And, and, and I, I give the example of, of, of the United States. I mean, 100, 150 years ago, African-Americans in this country were, were, were chattel. They were, they were property. They, they, they were not even considered human beings. And, and that had to change, and it changed. And it changed. So I'm saying Jews should not be afraid of becoming a minority at one time because they will. They will definitely become a, a minority at one point. But can we create a structure which is democratic where they feel that they can be comfortable even when they are no longer a majority? And, and this is the time to do it. When they have the power and when they have the maybe slight majority. So they know how what it is like to be in the majority and they know what it's like to be in a minority. So whatever rights they want for themselves when they become a minority, they should start giving to Palestinians today, to Arabs. Uh, look at the state of Israel itself today. Forget about the occupied territories. In Israel itself today, Arabs are like 20%, 22% of the population. 
and they're given zero power, yeah. zero power. Even if they have the vote in Knesset, they can't be part of the government structure. Uh, and, and this has to change. You have to recognize all the, all the people in the land. We have a number of comments and questions. Uh, I have it here too. You, you referred to it earlier about the disproportionate power structure uh, uh, between the Israelis and Palestinians. Israel's not only stronger, but employing an apartheid ethnic cleansing project. Uh, how can we conceive of one state? This question is, is from Don and, and Don Wagner and Linda Khatib, and then I'll add my own question to it. How can we conceive of one state with full equality of all its citizens when this form of militant Zionism is dominant? And then my question is, what, what would entice, in, in your proposal, what would entice Israel to give up their advantage, to even want to engage in such a just peace project that you're proposing? Well, the issue is not to try to entice them, I think, because every powerful group uh, will, 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 will consider any, any dilution of its privileges to be oppressive, to be wrong. Why would they give up uh, if I'm a slave owner? <laughs> why should I give up my slaves? Exactly. They are my property. Tell I us have to answer. be forced to do it. <laughs> I have to be forced to do it. That's, that's just as simply as that. Whether it's through internal or external pressures, whether it's BDS, economic pressure, whether it's trial before international tribunals that consider apartheid to be a crime against humanity. Uh, it's a crime today. Apartheid is a crime. It's no longer acceptable. Whether it's the movement of history, whether it's other forms of economic, social, cultural pressure. This is what happened in South Africa, by the way. And this is what's happening throughout the world. People forget it. That a hundred years ago, even in the West, even in the United States, women didn't have the vote. Women didn't have the vote. And that's only one century ago. So people who think that this kind of situation can be maintained indefinitely are fooling themselves. It cannot be maintained indefinitely. It will collapse. And, and I'm saying, instead of having it collapse in an ugly, hurtful uh, way, let's start already to think about the day after. Can we live together? Is it possible? And maybe it's hard. I'm not saying it's simple. I'm not saying it's going to be done uh, just by persuading individuals here or there. Uh, to, to convince them they have to really feel the pressure. Right now, they feel no pressure. They feel they have all the cards with them. They are powerful beyond immeasurably more powerful than the Palestinians and all their allies. And on top of that, they have the support of the United States, unquestioning support. So yes, right now, there's no reason for them to even consider uh, peace. Uh, but But if they are a little bit more uh, far-sighted, if they can think about history, if they can think about God, if they can think about the whole world, how it's changing, uh, they will realize that this is just a temporary state of affairs and that it is going to end one day. There's another question from the chat room uh, uh, from Kevin Morrow. You sound very much like the pragmatic yet hopeful Palestinians I've met over the years. How representative is this pragmatic yet hopeful outlook among Palestinians? Well, uh, I think Palestinians who are pragmatic and, and hopeful have had a lot of blows, uh, been slapped around so much uh, that they're, they're almost punch drunk uh, right now. Uh, but I, I, I would say there is almost a theological, a, a, a religious aspect, a spiritual aspect to it. I don't know if you've ever seen any of the pictures. Whenever there's a Palestinian home that's been destroyed and you see the, the woman sitting there with her hands up to God. 
She's not waiting for the United Nations. She's not waiting for the Arab world. Uh, she, she, she's, wait, she's waiting upon God. How, how, how come this is happening? Where are you, God? Uh, uh, why are you allowing this to happen? Uh, there, there is something very deep in, in, in human nature and, 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 and it's, it's found among Muslims as well as Christians uh, that, that, that says this is not going to continue forever. This cannot continue forever. This is unjust. This is unfair. There is either God or history or faith or something is going to intervene. It is not going to continue this way. Of course, theologically, as a Christian, uh, I, I put it in, in the context of, of, of the, the Psalms. You know, many of the Psalms are, 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 uh, are full of that, you know, how long, O oh Lord, how long, you yeah. know. Uh, about half the, the Psalms are like that. How, how is it possible? Why are you silent? Why, God, why don't you intervene? And the other half says, yes, he will intervene. Yes, God is sovereign in the affairs of people. Uh, so uh, that, that's theological. Uh, but but it, has, it has its echoes both in Islam, Judaism, and in the secular world where we believe that, that, that injustice cannot continue and that in the end, justice will prevail. Another thing I, I appreciated about your book, Jonathan, is, uh, of course, you uh, have been involved in negotiations yourself in the past. And as you know, in any tough negotiations, there's trust building measures that are built into every step of the process. And you list a number of action steps uh, toward a just one state solution. Uh, you list a number of them. I'd like for you to say a word about two of them that I chose here. Uh, one, you say expand language education as a means to reform education about the other. And the second one was, and this one I, I thought was very interesting. You said, rethink Palestinian outreach to settlers and Israel's outreach to Hamas. Can you say a word about both of those? Okay. Uh for many, many years, I'll start with the Palestinian one. For many years, the two-state solution uh, posited a geographic distribution uh, that Israel can have 67% of Palestine and the Arabs will only have 22% in the West Bank Gaza. So every settlement and every settler was, was like demonic, unacceptable. Totally, it's, it's like... This is what is destroying the possibilities of a pragmatic peace. Now, after all these years, after 50 years, with 700,000 settlers living in the, the occupied territories, including Jerusalem, of course, and I have to ask myself, you know, if I am willing to accommodate myself to Israel and the Israelis in Jaffa and Haifa and West Jerusalem, you know, I, I come across some settlers. I came across one rabbi that, that, that blew my mind. He, he was very reasonable. <laughs> he believed in the Palestinian right of return. He believed in equality. So he told me, why am I demonic, but your leftist friend who is actually living in an Arab's home, who actually kicked you out of your house, he's fine and I am not. And so I have to say to myself, okay, settlers can be demonized as long as we're talking about a two-state solution, about an Arab state, mini-state in the West Bank. But if there are settlers and settlers all over there, then I have to go back to the drawing table and I have to think about all of Palestine and I have to think about Jaffa and Haifa and the Galilee and the Negev. That's all Palestine to me now. And if that's the case, then these settlers are as objectionable or as unobjectionable as Israelis who are living uh, in Haifa, in Yaffa, in uh, Tel Aviv, in the Negev. So, so I have to start thinking, rethinking my attitude towards settlers. And also, Israelis have to start rethinking their attitudes towards Hamas. 
we have allowed a, a, a reality where two million people in Gaza are not part of the equation for most Israelis and for most of the world. When they think about Israel, Palestine, they're thinking about the West Bank and they're thinking about Jerusalem. They're not thinking about the what's called Israeli Arabs, the Israeli citizens who are Palestinians, and they're not thinking of Gaza. What do you mean? You have to think about Gaza. There's two million people living in Gaza. And if you're thinking about Gaza, you have to start thinking about Hamas. You cannot ignore Hamas. They are a part of the Palestinian people. Just like you couldn't think about the Palestinian questions without the PLO, you can't think about the Palestinian question today without Hamas. So you must start thinking about how do we bring Hamas into the conversation and into the equation? How, how, how do we need to change and how Hamas needs to change to come into the equation? So the settlers now are part of the equation, whether we like it or not. And Hamas is part of the equation, whether we like it or not. And if we have to change the paradigm, if we move beyond the current paralysis, then we, we have to start thinking about Hamas. And we have to start thinking about the settlers. Say a word about this language education as a means to reform education about the other. Ah, it's, 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 it's uh, one of my ideas. Uh, and, and it has to do with Israeli security, actually. Because Israelis are so obsessed with security or claim to be, and I tell them the biggest danger to your security doesn't come from Iran and cannot be cured by F-36s. Because the biggest danger to your security comes from a, a, a Palestinian schoolgirl with a pair of scissors in her pocket who's 12 years old. How do you deal with her? How do you deal with the sense of injustice? And the way you deal with it is 10% of the defense budget of the future state must go to a special ministry of cooperation and tolerance and education. Because that's, that's how you obtain security, by learning about the other and by the other learning about you and by having joint cooperation between them. And, 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 and I, I want to make it clear, this is not a substitute for justice. This is part of what creates a new just society. I need to learn more about Israeli Jews, and they need to learn more about me and my people and my culture and, 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 my, and my history. And, and that creates and produces more security than having more tanks and more fighters and more uh, drones that can kill people from far. Yeah, that's one of your essential elements of a new order, this uh, very interesting ministry of cooperation and coexistence is what you call it, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And 10% um, of the defense budget has to go there. The last action step, this, this trust building measure that you mentioned, you say, take joint actions toward a just peace. But in this part, in, in this particular section, you aren't very specific as to what you're suggesting. Give us just one example, would you? I mean, I, I know that you've thought about this, you've had to. Give us one example of this joint action toward a just peace that you'd like to see taken. Oh, well, I think... Uh... Everybody knows that some of the right-wing settlers are always out during the olive harvest, uh, attacking uh, Palestinians, uh, burning and cutting down trees. Uh, but if you have Palestinian and Jewish people committed to equality, going out into the fields, protecting the farmers, planting new olive trees, breaking the the rules that have been set by the apartheid regime, actually taking Palestinians in their cars to go through the checkpoints, uh, to enter into the different settlements, to go over and under and through the wall, 
uh, to uh, actually to challenge the system. The system today is made is based on hafrada, separation, and and the Israeli left has bought into separation, and the two state language is based on separation. And I'm saying if the two state paradigm has collapsed, then the separation mechanisms need to be challenged and need to be fought and need to be addressed. And I might not be able to tear down the whole wall, but I can take a whole number of steps that are based on equality, that are based on challenging the, the, the roads that are only for settlers. Mm -hmm. Surely we can address that. The march of return from Gaza, that was a wonderful opportunity that was missed by everybody. It was missed by the Israeli left. And it was missed by the Palestinians in the West Bank who allowed the, the separation between Fatah and Hamas uh, to allow them to ignore or downplay what was happening. What was happening was a wonderful attempt to bring us together non-violently. And, and, and the massacres that was taking place with the snipers, they got away with it primarily because everybody was so committed to the demonization of Hamas and to the so-called two-state solution, the PA in, in, in Ramallah and, and trying to strengthen Mahmoud Abbas and his regime in Ramallah. And so we allowed them to get away with what they did in Gaza, which which was which was horrible, absolutely horrible. There's a number of comments in the chat room about uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, the split in the Jewish community in the U.S. Uh, how they're passionately divided. Our friend Bing Heckman from California asks, "Is there leverage working with Jews in the U.S.?" And, and I, I know that you're working with uh, Mennonite uh, Palestine Israel Network and other PIN groups in the United States. Talk to us about Jewish Voice for Peace and other Jewish allies in the US uh, where you think there might be a possibility with the Jewish left and Jewish voices of conscience here in the US. I, I, I think that they are very, very important and pivotal. Uh, people don't realize that uh, at the time when uh, in Israel, Israel is moving more and more and more towards the right wing, uh, American Jews are becoming much more open, much more liberal, much more uh, conscious of the need uh, for equality. Uh, it's, 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 it's a joke that and, and, uh, Israel is one of the few countries in the world where uh, people favor Trump over uh, any Democratic rival uh, by, by a margin of like 82 percent uh, are in favor of Trump among Israeli Jews. But in America, it's 80 percent who are in favor of Biden or the Democrats, no matter who they are, as opposed to Trump. So we have now a new reality where supporters of Israel and supporters of right-wing Zionism feel more comfortable in their alliance with right-wing anti-Semites than they are with ordinary people who really uh, favor uh, equality and favor democracy. So I think Jews in this country uh, are, are, are at a point of crisis. They, they cannot feel at all comfortable with <coughs> Netanyahu and the current Israeli government. Uh, and, and, and so their conscience, I would even go and say their ethics, their religion as Jews prohibits them from continuing to support the state of Israel. So they are torn and increasingly they are going to be torn more and more. And then they will have to decide between their Zionism and their humanity. And, and I think most of them are going to lean more towards humanity. There are, there, let's, get, let's get practical for a second. There are a lot of uh, one state 
uh, um, programs out there uh, being proposed. The one that I know the best, I, I'm also on the board of ICAD USA. I work with Jeff Halper pretty closely. In fact, I was on a conference call with him this morning um, about a program we have coming up. To, what do you think about their 10-step program, uh, Awad Abdel Fattah and Jeff and uh, a whole host of other Palestinians and uh, um, uh, Jew, uh, Israeli Jews. Are you in touch with that group at all? And, and what do you think of their proposal? Yes, I think there are many, many good uh, people with, with, with good proposals. And, and, and I don't want to so much dwell about the differences between my ideas and theirs, because my ideas are not necessarily the best. Uh, what I do want is for people to start the conversation and to start thinking about these things realistically. A lot of Palestinians, I, and, and I'll, be, I'll be frank, a lot of Palestinians will quickly support a, a, a one-state solution yeah, because they think we're going to become a majority very soon and then we can do whatever we want. No, uh, that, that is not my view. My view is we believe in a one-state solution that genuinely addresses the interests of everybody regardless of who happens to be in the majority. We really need to get rid of the demographic argument, the demographic demon. Otherwise, every new immigrant that comes in is resisted and is viewed as a, as, as, as a threat and a danger to us. And every additional Palestinian baby that is born is viewed with trepidation by, by, by Israeli Zionists. Golda Meir said she couldn't sleep at night thinking of all the babies that are being born. Uh, and, 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 and that has to be changed. And the only way you change it is by creating new structures that are deliberately and consciously open to the needs, the fears, the, the phobias, the frustrations of both people and tries to address them. I'm aware of the time, but I do have a couple three more questions to ask you that tries to gather up a number of the uh, uh, comments in the chat room and questions there. You and I see Alex Awad here on the call. Greetings, Alex, good to see you. You, you all uh, have done kind of a, a, a dynamic duo speaking tour around the US on Christian Zionism and you referred to it earlier. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the vice president and the secretary of state are two of the most prominent Christian Zionist um, uh, politicians in the country today. And it's not only a, a, a Christian heresy but all, and a threat to Palestinian Christians, but it's dangerous to a just and lasting peace. Uh, do you want to say just one more word about Christian Zionists in this conversation today? Yes, uh, I, I'd like to say that they are not only a danger, not only a threat, not only a heresy, but that the vast majority of people who we would consider Christian Zionists really don't know. They really don't know better. They really don't know their Bible and they don't know certainly the realities on the ground there. And they have never had to deal with or be confronted with very, I'll give you just a very small example. Many uh, evangelicals are, are strict literalists and uh, the Christian Zionists would throw this verse at them from Genesis that says, you know, to Abraham, I will bless those who bless thee and curse those who curse thee. Through your seeds will all the nations of the world be blessed. And that is used to say, if you support Israel, you get blessing. If you don't support Israel, you get God's curse because they are the seed of Abraham and they are the source of blessing for you politically. <laughs> now, I've, I've sat with some uh, Christian Zionists and say, all right, who is the seed of Abraham? Let's open the Bible. Let's see what Galatians says about this verse. Paul says, the seed of Abraham is used in the singular that is Christ. It's the seed, not many seeds. Well, I mean, forget hermeneutics and forget interpretation. Here's a very clear interpretation that says 
seed of Abraham means Jesus Christ. So many of these people say, oh, I never heard that. Nobody ever told me that. Well, Jesus was very clear telling those people who says we are children of Abraham, nonsense. God can make out of these stones children of Abraham. So when we can talk with Christian Zionists, and I'm talking mostly about ordinary people, pastors, etc. I'm not talking about the John Hagee and uh, those who are financially uh, hooked in with uh, Netanyahu and his people. Uh, ordinary people, they're, they're, they're nice, decent, ordinary people. They like to they read their Bible. And, and they, they have never met a Palestinian, much less a Christian or an evangelical Palestinian in their lives. But they, they, they think they're still, you know, Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho and then, <laughs> and the walls came tumbling down. <laughs> and, and we are living in a time when we see the Israel, God's people, you know, fighting the evil forces. And of course, we're with the good people. We're with God's people. So we can talk to these people and speak their language and read the Bible with them and pray with them and, and show them what, what the Bible really teaches about uh, the, these issues. We should not leave them and say, Ugh, those people are hopeless. Uh, I think that the, the Democrats did that with Trump and his supporters for a while and, 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 and they, uh, they, they suffered accordingly. We need to engage them and engage them in love, engage them in, with understanding and engage them with uh, appreciation uh, and, 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 and really educate them as to what the Bible really says about these things. I want to follow up on this. Uh, and, and I really, Jonathan, thank you so much for this. I just have a couple more questions. Um, recently, the Christian leaders in Palestine issued, they call it the cry uh, for hope. Uh, describing and and uh, every one of the uh, mainline denominations, uh, it's addressed to us in in uh, the church. Uh, these Christian leaders uh, uh, issued cry for hope, describing how the very integrity of the gospel is at stake in Palestine. We at Indiana Center for Middle East Peace are members of the the global Kairos for Palestine that issued the cry. As, uh, of course, this follows the 2009 Kairos Palestine document and, and other calls from Christian leaders to their sisters and brothers in Christ around the world and to other people of goodwill. Uh, two things in Cry for Hope uh, that, that they ask of Christians and other people of goodwill around the world. Number one, theologically, an inclusive vision of the land that has, quote, a universal mission. The land has a universal mission, it says. And number two, support for BDS, support for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, but recently condemned as anti-Semitic by Mike Pompeo. Do you want to say, I've been trying to pitch Cry for Hope wherever I go, with whomever I, with whomever I speak. Do you want to Tell us why Cry for Hope is so important and you want make what make whatever reference you'd like, but maybe to BDS and to the land as universal mission. Well, it's it's you know, I'm definitely supportive of, 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 of the Kairos document and of Cry uh, for Hope. Uh, basically, uh, what attracted me first to the BDS movement was was that it was a, a nonviolent uh, response. <laughs> I mean, if people are opposed to the occupation and opposed to settlements and opposed to this, uh, how do they want to fight it? They will, certainly not with weapons. Armed struggle for them is, uh, is, is horrible. They don't want to do it. Well, then we do it nonviolently. And what better than BDS, boycotts, divestment, and sanctions, bringing international law to bear. And I think that Israel recognized very, very early on the potent power of the, um, the moral power of BDS. So they went after it like crazy. They have a government ministry called the Ministry of Strategic Affairs that pumps tens of millions of dollars surreptitiously in secret to fight BDS everywhere. When I was in Canada, 
one particular Zionist organization claimed that they actually spent in the six figures, which means no less than $100,000, per year, per college in Canada. That's correct. Yeah, I've BDS. Yeah. Why? Because they realize that BDS brings up the issue on the basis of morality, on the basis of justice, on the basis of ethics, but it translates that into concrete action. For many, many years, the Zionist lobby was very glad with all the churches. You can make all the statements you want. You can make all the resolutions you want. In fact, there was a booklet that was issued about all the different resolutions from 1948 until today by the different churches. Doesn't bother Israel at all. But when you start translating that into concrete action, then they realize the gig is up. The gig is up. Israel cannot live without the massive, massive support of the West and specifically of Christians in the West. Because that support has been monetized into money, into political power, into military power, into technological meetings, into a, a, a world frame that places Israel as the good guys and the enemies as the bad guys. They, they have also weaponized this idea of anti-Semitism, not to fight anti-Semitism or discrimination or racism, but to fight the Palestinian advocacy groups. So they came up with a definition of anti-Semitism that includes anti-Zionist activities, that includes opposition to the state of Israel. And now Pompeo is, is openly saying, this is what we're doing. We're not just going to pass a, a, a law which is unconstitutional anyway. Uh, we're not going to pass directives. We are going to declare BDS to be anti uh uh, Semitic. We're going to declare anti-Zionism to be anti-Semitic. So anybody who is guilty of any of these things is by definition a, a hateful, uh, racist, bigoted, anti-Semite. And who wants to be that? I knew that that would press your buttons, Jonathan, and your passion speaks uh, loudly. And I really appreciate uh, your support for Cry for Hope and your support of BDS. I think we all do here. You know, one of the interesting things is that uh, one of the consultants, one of the American consultants of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs is the Republican pollster and spinmeister Frank Luntz, who's done a lot of wordsmithing and uh, talk about communications. Uh, he was featured, of course, in the Occupation of the American Mind by Sut Jolly and the Media Education Foundation. So I'm glad that you pointed out this, this ministry within Israel that has millions and millions and millions of shekels now at its disposal. Uh, I want to close with, uh, um, there's a number of questions and comments in the chat room about U.S. politics and the incoming administration. Um, uh, today, uh, President-elect Biden uh, appointed uh, as his Secretary of State designate Tony Blinken, uh, a Zionist. Um, uh, we know that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris both have been ardent supporters of Israel uh, for their for their entire careers, and they they uh, boast about that. Yet, for the first time in in many years. There have been positive signs of pro-Palestinian support in Congress. And one of the presidential, one of the Democratic presidential candidates, Bernie Sanders, spoke in support of Palestinian rights. Uh, and public opinion, you talked about Jewish Voice or Peace before and young Jews. Uh, public opinion uh, for a more even-handed approach in the Middle East has been growing. So uh, to to kind of wrap up our conversation today, do you see uh, any openings with this new administration? Where might there be openings with this new administration for moving forward the cause of justice for Palestinians? 
Well, I often make a distinction between hope and optimism. <laughs> I think those who are looking for uh, changes uh, because Trump is leaving and Biden is coming in, uh, they're talking about optimism. And I'm not optimistic. I don't think that there's going to be the kind of radical change that is necessary with this administration. But I am full of hope. And hope is a different quality. And hope doesn't depend on the US administration or on this Secretary of State or on, or, or on that particular uh, advisor to the president. We've had people in the presidency. Usually we find out about it after they leave office. Uh, Jimmy Carter is wonderful. Uh, even Obama is now beginning to sound uh, uh, a little bit much more reasonable. Uh, and uh, we will find that many people after they leave office uh, sound much more understanding and open uh, to, to these things. Uh, so I, I don't place much faith in this administration. I do place a lot of faith in the American people, including the Jewish community in the United States, including those who are Christians, and some very, very wonderful evangelicals who are beginning to be open to this type of discussion. Uh, and I think that, and this is really, really uh, sensitive, that the two-state solution today is the alibi that is preventing people from addressing the real question. Yeah. Now, I don't say that lightly because for many years I was a supporter of the two-state solution. I worked very hard towards it. I thought it was really a, a, a possible uh, pragmatic compromise that people can live with. But about four years ago, I was uh, somewhere and I met Thomas Dine, the head of APEC for many years. And I said, oh, you know, uh, by the way, he says, I'm no longer with uh, APEC, I'm doing something else. I said, oh, I'm curious, uh, what's the position of uh, APEC these days? Before I finished the sentence, he said, two states, two states. <laughs> APEC believes in the two-state solution. <laughs> For them, it is the best, the most wonderful <laughs> alibi. Uh -huh. As long as you can maintain the language of two states, you don't have to deal with the reality on the ground, which is apartheid and racism and, and, and oppression and, and, and uh, total disenfranchisement. It's a, a tool for disenfranchising and disempowering the Palestinian people. You have a Palestinian authority. It's, they are the problem. Get your act together. Talk to your leaders. They are the ones who are the problem. So in a way, we have to say that to work for real justice, sometimes you have to break through this language of two states and start thinking in new terms. And this is what I'm trying to do with this little booklet that I just published. And Jonathan, thank you for coming today. Do you have any parting words that you'd like to share with well, uh, I'm looking at some of the chats and some of the people on the call. And uh, what I want to say is that we are in a very difficult and long struggle. And uh, people have committed a lot of their time and their lives and their resources to this issue. And it is very easy uh, to take partisan positions and, and hang on to them. But if we really care about peace and justice and what's good for the peoples of the area, as well as the peoples of the world. We really must change the conversation. You may or may not agree with some of the ideas in my, in, in, in my uh, little book, but what is important is to start the conversation 
of thinking in new terms and acting in new ways. It is not enough to just think and talk because that's one thing we always do all the time and we spend lots of time arguing about whether this or that position is better or no. But we must find ways to translate it into action. Action on the ground. Action that influences and touches people's lives. In the end, we're talking about people. We're talking about human beings. And people need to live. People need to survive. People need to thrive. They cannot live in a situation of injustice and oppression and insecurity. Ultimately, peace is in the interest of everyone. But peace does not mean you just accept whatever is and you find an accommodation. But you're always moving things towards a more just situation for everybody. In this sense, I have to say that moving away from a two-state solution, two-state has been a comfort, a, a, a place where you can lie down and wait, wait for the right time, for the right leader, for labor to win in Israel. It's now number six. I don't know if they even get enough members to get stay in the government. Wait for the right Israeli leader, wait for the right Palestinian leader, wait for the right American leader uh, to win an election. That will never happen. We have to work to change the whole situation and we have to work for justice and we have to move in different and new directions. I'm sure that most of the people on this call are committed to peace, are committed to justice. We just need to have the courage and the ability to start thinking in new terms and to think out of the box and to change reality because reality can and will change. And that's what I'm trying to do. Jonathan, uh, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much, everybody. And I'm sorry, I'm just uh, looking at the chat. There are many issues that have been raised that have not been addressed, but I hope that you'll read the book. Feel free to send me your comments, even if you disagree with me, especially if you disagree with me, uh, because I think we should get the conversation going. And thank you and God bless you all. Thank you, John. Uh, bye now.